Good evening, and welcome to Creatively Speaking. I'm Zenobia A. Rickford, and the topic today is, what is your painting saying? And we have a guest speaker, Michael Singletary. Thank you. And we have two artists from Prince George's Artists Association, Michael Spears. Happy to be here. And Lorraine. Hello. And Lorraine Harris. And our moderator today is E.L. Whitley. Good evening. Welcome to Creatively Speaking, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you. Uh, Michael J. Singletary, artist, filmmaker, radio and television producer, has exhibited in over 300 different fine art exhibits. He has exhibited with many noted artists, including Andy Warhol, Romere Bearden, Chuck Close, Red mm -hmm. Grooms, David ha Hockney, Robert Indiana, Luel Nesbeth, Klaus Olenberg, Fernando Botero, Philip Perlstein, and many, many more. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to take this time to introduce to some and present to all Michael Singletary, artist extraordinaire. Tell us, Michael, about who you are. Who, who is Michael Singletary? Michael Singletary is an artist. I was always an artist. I started off as an artist when I was very, very young. Um, ever since I can remember, especially even around kindergarten, I was drawing and painting. And I feel particularly blessed because I was think I really started drawing when I was in church. I used to trace everything. Those little cards they used to give you out in in church. Yeah. Yes. I used to trace that because I was so anxious to go to school that a lot of times, like when I was growing up, there was we had we had four brothers and sisters, and. There was no Sesame Street back those days. Mm -hmm. There yes. was no Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. All it was, and there wasn't even um, after school c centers. No. And I um, used to have to stay with my moms. And my mom, sometimes she had another, I had another younger brother with me. And he. And I had to stay at home. So when I stayed at home, well, I, I basically drew it and tried to teach myself how to read because I was so, so anxious to get to school. And it wasn't happening fast enough for me. So I, was, I feel particularly blessed because of the church. Because in church, you know, you know, you had to do posters and banners and all that. And I just did it. And it came very, very natural for me mm -hmm. to do it. So... I'm here today and I'm happy, particularly happy, happy because, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years and I've seen a lot of mm -hmm. people pass through, a lot of really great painters pass through. And I feel really, really happy that I'm still doing it. And I've been fortunate and blessed to be able to go and study in Europe and study in Africa when I was 19 studied That's in new great. school research and social research when I was 12, studied with Benny Andrews and Romeo Bearden and all, a host of all these great, great, great black painters. And I, don't, I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now, but it was a wonderful, wonderful kind of a life, even though there was some ups and downs. So mm -hmm. real happy, you know, I went through school and I guess I heard a quote from Charles Barkley, the basketball player. He said, and I'm paraphrasing him, he said that they, want, they, they pay me to play basketball, and now they're paying me to watch basketball because now he's a commentator. Yes. And he said, I'm a very happy man, and those are my sentiments exactly. I feel like I'm really happy I'm still here. Yes. Which is more important than anything yes. else. Right. Definitely. And I'm surrounded by so many great painters and I've been around great painters. You know, so 
I guess in a lot of ways I feel great about doing some of the things that I do. Okay. Well, could you tell us about, this is my own curiosity, tell, tell us about Bill Cosby and how he was instrumental in opening the doors of um, opportunity for you in the world of film and television. Well, I studied, my last year in college, I, I, I had studied, I had been to Africa during the summer, you know, with, with this, um, the Union Theologic Seminary. I was the youngest person there. Also in that whole group was Betty Shabazz, Eric Lincoln, and all these incredibly great, great writers. And I was a painter, you know, and I didn't know Africa. At first we went to Paris, and that was like really extremely, ha I was extremely happy for being there. And then we went to the University of Ghana and of course, being 19 years old in 1969, you know, I was just overjoyed and overwhelmed mm -hmm. at the fact that I can study one um, African sculpture. I found out right away that I couldn't carve wood <laughs> the way that they, um, you know, I mean, I mean, it looked like it was fairly simple. And those guys were just chipping away, and I was like, oh, I can't, I can't do it. And then I got this and no wood sculpture for me. But the Bill Cosby thing happened. Because I, someone told me, first of all, I had a cousin who was directing Cosby, but he had nothing to do with the set designers or anything like that. But just out of curiosity, if we all can remember the popularity of Bill Cosby and what he did for black painters, he was putting black art on television. Right. I mean, that was something that was never done before. Never and I was amazed. And I said, you know, just out of a hunch, why don't I just send him some stuff? Mm -hmm. And I was living in Mount Vernon at the time, and my three doors down, Flish Rashad was living. And, you know, she was the wife of Bill Cosby on the Cosby Show. Right. right. And she said, yeah, send it down and see what happens, you know? And then all of a sudden, I got a, I got a letter from California that said they want to use some pieces on the Cosby Show. And there was a, some print pieces, and one of the pieces was the house party. And that was a very, very, very popular piece for me. And, you know, it led to other things. Mm -hmm. Because if we can all remember, back in those days, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about there was no black television shows on air at all. And, you know, maybe yeah. you saw Diane Carroll. Maybe you saw um, every now and then you, you, it, or Ed Sullivan's show you would see um, Sammy Davis. Yeah. Or you, sometimes you'll see yeah. the Supremes. And right. we all get, I mean, I knew when somebody black was on the Ed Sullivan show because the neighborhood was oh, yeah, empty. Neighborhood. Everybody was like oh, yeah. crowding around these little, small, little Ooh. black and white television shows. I sets. remember that. Yes, yes. <laughs> And, Absolutely. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, those kind of things were just as inspiring for me as a young artist to see black successful people as being around successful painters, you know, because I was around a lot of successful painters. One of the people I was around was um, one of my best teachers was Max Ginsburg, who was like in charge of the whole Ashcan School of Painting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just incredible that I was able to work with them. But you know, people that influenced me a lot were, I mean, James Brown. I mean, because I was just happy for his success. Mm, yeah. And I wanted to be that person. And actually, I thought at one time that I was gonna be the first black painter because nobody ever talked about black art when I was growing up. Yeah. And there was no black books. The, the, the Porter book, yes. the Negro artist, Yes. Might have been mm -hmm. a great publication. And I tried to meet every single artist in that book after I found out. But I remember when I was 12, or 11 or 12, and I was going to the new school on Saturday, I ran into Benny Andrews, who I was so happy to meet because he was the first black artist that I had had any association on the professional art level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, Benny's a very fair-skinned brother, so I wasn't really quite sure at first. <laughs> <laughs> if he was an African American, <laughs> but Benny in turn introduced me to all <coughs> the black painters that he knew, including Romeo Bearden, including uh, Marla Ryder, Huey Lee Smith. All those guys were in New York, and they all were associated with the Art Students League. Mm -hmm. And even though I wasn't associated, I, I was just happy and relieved that I didn't have to be the first guy. That was black, yes. and you know, because it was that it was that period where yeah, it was question. about like, you know, you know the the first. I mean, you know, that credit to your race crap, yeah. all that <laughs> stuff that they used right. to say back in the day. I'm you here. know, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest thrills of my whole life was meeting number one, Jackie Robinson. Oh wow! I met Jackie Robinson, and we he, I wind up doing an art show when I was. 13 years old at the at the uh, New York City World's Fair and he was there and it was just like oh my god because that's what my father used to talk about was Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. and the second really encouraging thing was I met Sammy Davis Jr. Mm -hmm. when I was like about 13 years old at they had these things called the Sarays in Greenwich Village and I had my artwork up there and I saw a little Sammy I'm six foot five, so I couldn't call him Little Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> and right. I met Sammy Davis, and that was enough. I mean, I didn't want to wash my hands for a week because Sammy mm -hmm. was as large as Michael Jackson at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Sammy was huge. Yeah. And those are the people. I, mean, I couldn't even tell my friends. and say, yo, guess what? I met Sammy, and I'm doing some work with Jackie Robinson at the Singer Pavilion. Where my artwork is featured and the New York City World's Fair. And even then, that didn't really mean that much because I thought it was going to keep coming and it's going to be easy. Dang, it ain't, it ain't. I mean, later on, it didn't happen. Like, But, you know, art got me into everything that I ever wanted to do, even mm -hmm. film and television later. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I guess I'm fairly good. So you, you sort of answered one of my questions because I said of all of your endeavors, which one do you feel had the greatest impact on you as an artist, and I think you've answered that question with the two paramount people in your life that you met, mm -hmm. Jackie Robinson and um, Sammy, Sammy Davis, Davis Jr. Jr. And the other person was Gordon Parks Jr. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Gordon yes. Parks probably did more to help me in terms of, okay. I mean, not personally, but you know, I wind up working with him later when I was working in film, mm -hmm. but I saw an article in Life magazine on gangs, and I was fascinated about it. I don't know whether or not it was just because there was black people in the gangs, and I kind of related to because in my neighborhood there was a lot of gangs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a lot of that stuff. And I was like, "Wow, who is this guy?" And I I didn't know if he was black or white, but I just thought his photography was just stunning. Mm -hmm. And then when I found out that he was black, African-American, and I, 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 I looked him up and he, they said, this guy write operas, he write plays, he writes movies, he does poetry. And that was so important for me to know that because when I was growing up, they used to ask you questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you had yeah. to pick one thing. <laughs> right. And I was like, no, I want to be him. Mm -hmm. This guy does it all. He write, I mean, I said, this guy's writing an opera. I, don't even, I wasn't even aware of operas at that time. And he's writing plays, and he's like, he's a painter. And I said, I want to be a painter, writer, and I put it all in one, one, one big word. And, you know, and then that kind of made my life better. But, you know, I, I met him later, and I worked with his son on two really terrible films. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Gordon Parks Jr. before he died, of course. Okay. And yeah. I la ma later met him and got to know him a lot better when I was with the Directors Guild of America. And I, and I met him in the, in, on the elevator. On the, on, 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 and this is like when I was, you know, when I was working. 
I met him on the elevator, and I said, oh, man, you're going in Bronx. I got to tell you stuff. And I think I probably wore his ear out. And we started talking, and we got to know each other, and he got to know some of his family. And, you know, the last time I think I talked, and then he told me something that really surprised me. He said, I used to play basketball. I used to be one of the best. Mm -hmm. And I said, nah, man, this is too much. <laughs> I mean, you did all that because I follow his pattern. Mm -hmm. Because yes. at that time, you have to understand that they weren't telling black kids to, you know, go and become a doctor, a lawyer, or become an artist or an architect. I wanted to be an architect at first, but then the math was just a little bit too heavy for me. And I was like, mm -hmm. can't. and I was good ma in math. I was incredible. But I think that I fell into the fine arts area because that's what I was really, really good at. And I was fortunate enough to go to, to Art and Design High School mm -hmm. where I met people like Hollingsworth, Alvin Hollingsworth, who was, became a buddy, and we started doing exhibits together. And the most important thing was, I was like the young maverick, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, because I just, and I, I always took that for granted. I always, because you know, I mean, I always had this dual thing going on because I also was an athlete and I wanted to be an athlete. And I just kind of took art for granted a lot of ways, but I painted every single day and I drew every single day. And I was so curious about learning about techniques and painting styles because my first. person that I really fell in love with in terms of being an artist was Rembrandt. And we took a, a field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I used to write down the subway stops and I found that it was 17 minutes to get from my house to the Metropolitan Museum of Art from the South Bronx. And I knew that when I got out of school at three, I would run, because I had to be home at five. I, I would run to the train, get on the train, get to the Metropolitan by 3.30, look at one or two pieces of work, back on the subway. I did this for like almost two years. Because if my mother knew I was doing what I was doing, <laughs> I would have got, I would have got <laughs> really seriously Mm -hmm. whooped mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. and I wasn't allowed to do it okay you know? having um, the knowledge that there are many artists out there what advice would you give to an, em an emerging artist just to keep working because it doesn't come right away even if it happens right away and you do a style that works for you I mean it's just like the music business in a lot of ways you could yeah. be hot one year and the next year you may not to go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, there are artists that have a staying power, but that happens in all the arts, whether it's dance or music. The people have a staying power. The Annie Warhols, sometimes it's luck. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's, but you know, most artists, unfortunately, are not going to get there. But you know, right. art is not about like getting there in terms of making money. Art is up here. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's the heart. Yeah. It it's something that yeah. you have to the do. And believe. When you start following trends and <coughs> styles, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Right. Very, very easy to get in trouble because all of a sudden, if it doesn't work, then it becomes like a career. And there's no such thing as a career in art. There's, there's about, it's a lifestyle. It's you. And you, you make a choice. And I knew that when I was very young because when I was young, I used to be down in the village and there were some really incredible painters. And I said, how come you guys are not making it right. like this? And they, and they like, they would just say, don't worry about it. If you do it, you do it because do it. you love it. Right. That's right. And I'm just fortunate, That's like right. I said earlier, That's right. that I'm still doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm doing it okay. Mm -hmm. passion. And that's what I do. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. you do. Well, this has been so enlightening. Um, Michael and we're so glad that you're here. We have two members who are fairly new to our organization, but they're not new to the world of art. Lorraine Harris has a beautiful piece in front of our table, and I'd like for her to talk about our work. We need well, to focus. as you can uh, see, this is one of my abstract pieces that I completed about a year ago.
Mm -hmm. um, and it's the nature of abstract that there's no particular subject matter. It depends on the viewer's experience in right. terms of what he sees in a particular uh, piece of work. I mean, I can elaborate a bit on what it means to me, yes. but I, yes. I really don't like to guide the viewer into how he should feel about a particular painting. Mm -hmm. I feel that it should, they should get into their psyche. Right. And it's their uh, experiences that should determine the context in which they view uh, the painting. Uh, although this work is untitled, yes. I tend to call it Mercy. Okay, <laughs> I was about to ask, uh, in terms of the, the piece, what are you trying to communicate? to the public? I think with all of my work, I try to uh, communicate, I guess, a sense of compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would like for people to look at my work and actually feel something. It doesn't yes. matter exactly what that feeling is, but it, if it evokes some kind of emotion in you, then I think mm -hmm. that uh, my mission has, has been accomplished. Uh, the reason that I I'd refer to this piece is mercy, because there is, even though it's abstract, there is a bit of a representational, figurative piece mm -hmm. over in the, uh, the far right-hand side. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it seems as if there are, there's oh, a couple there. I do see And they're that. going mm -hmm. through something that uh, appears to be very traumatic. Yes, yes She I has see her it arms too. raised up and yeah. he has his hands, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, beside yeah, his head. Left. And, and yeah, I would I think it. that at that point it seems like it was such a, a traumatic uh, period that they were going yes. through that I thought mercy would be something mm -hmm. that would be appropriate, okay. and that's why I refer to it as, as mercy. Now, Michael, you have two beautiful pieces. And Michael, tell us a little bit about your background, because I understand you were a gallery owner, and you've also, you've also had a piece of artwork in a film. Yes, uh, I had uh, the James Gallery for about three years up on mm -hmm. Georgia Avenue, uh, mm -hmm. about a block from Silver Spring. And, uh, uh, I started uh, the James Gallery and named it after my father, who had okay. passed. And uh, the gallery went went along fine. And then uh, uh, after we had some problems, which were you know the the, the shootings and all yes, of that in two thousand in two thousand yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it started going downhill because one of them happened in the area, <coughs> and I couldn't recover from that. So um, right. the opportunity came up for me to uh, to go back to school and. Uh, that's what I took. The, the, the State of Play mm -hmm. uh, was the name of the movie, and uh, somebody from movie. Universal Universal Pictures saw it at uh, WPFW, uh, uh, oh, and yeah. they, uh, they, they contacted me, mm -hmm. and they licensed uh, a print to be shown in the movie, and that, I think it was around, I'm not sure, 2006 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I, if you recall, I told you I have that. Uh, movie and I love it. I've looked <laughs> at it several times, yeah. and I say I keep saying I'm going to put that movie on again and look at it again <laughs> and see if I can find that. that I painting. never really looked at the entire movie, uh, mm -hmm. but I've been told. Uh, my daughter told me that she uh, she looked at it, but she didn't know if she saw it and she didn't think so. with so much going on at one time. Yeah. But uh, uh, I've never really looked at the complete movie, but. Uh, Certainly, they paid a license fee and they went uh -huh. ahead and uh, put it in the movie. Oh, that's or cool. at least they had the opportunity to put it in put the movie. Put it in the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what is your inspiration? Let's see, you have two beautiful abstracts there. M my inspiration, the, uh, I do purely non, uh, non objective abstracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, my inspiration comes from uh, the music world. Okay. okay. Uh, I like music, I use music <coughs> and I take the creative license from the parallel universe of multiverses mm -hmm. and, and have uh, come up with a premise or concept that uh, music take us, takes us to another world. And, yes. and that's where I tried to go to interpret my art. This one particular piece is called Breaking Aftermath. Mm -hmm. It was did behind 50 Cent's pe uh, piece, The Club. Uh, I oh, used to stay okay. in the club, so that, that, <laughs> that hits, hits home with me. And mm -hmm. uh, the line work, uh, I, I'm, it's rooted in line. All of my work is rooted in line. Uh, and this is really called uh, Breaking Aftermath after, uh, after that uh, piece. And uh, what, as I, I use a flat ground and, of course, a white reverse out. And I, I don't uh, plan a piece. I, I, uh, I stopped that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I go in after the music fills me up. Okay, yes. I go and let the, the melody and the rhythm Mm -hmm. guide me into what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And sometimes I use a uh, minimalist uh, 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 approach, approach, which is what this piece over here is called soft rocks. Uh, uh -huh. I didn't go in it to be an organic piece, or, uh, and, uh, but it, it turned out to be more of the natural world. But mm -hmm. there are minimalist lines in it, very few, and it worked with that particular piece. And what are the mediums that you This is mixed media. This right here is watercolor. Uh, soft rocks is watercolor, uh, acrylics. Uh, and charcoal. Uh, this one here is uh, acrylics and charcoal only. Okay. And I'm That's sorry, nice. a little pastel in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to neglect our moderator because she is a surrealist. Tell well, us a little bit about you. Well, um, I am an artist. I'm a painter. I'm a surrealist. Um, I like to take people into a world that really doesn't exist, it only exists in my mind. And I like to take people on journeys. I look at my art as going on a journey, and it could be my own personal journey. I never thought of it in that respect until just here of late. I started looking at all my works and where I was when I met you in 2008, yes. and where I've, where I, I've come from, I, I was, painting all of my life, but I stopped and became a teacher and teaching well, small really children. Stop. No, I didn't stop because <laughs> I majored in early childhood education where art mm -hmm. was an integral part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy for me to continue to be creative, but not until I got out of the school system was I able to uh, create things that I have always wanted to paint uh, as I did some years prior to going into the teaching profession because I went into the teaching profession quite late. So 30 years had lapsed being in the school system to going back, back to, painting, to painting to what mm -hmm. I wanted to paint. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just painting everything right. because I'm like a kid in a, um, a kid who just Candy got store. glasses for the first time and he couldn't see for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden when he puts these glasses on, the world just opens up to him What's and up? he sees things. Well, this is what happened to me <coughs> after I retired. The world opened up to me and now I can paint what E.L. wants to paint. I can and relate to what you're saying when you yes. say that it, it's yes. a, a journey. I think we had a conversation uh, before that sometimes it's almost like therapy for me. Yes. I think I made the comment to you that I'm yes. not sure if I'm painting the picture sometimes or if the painting is, is actually yes. mm -hmm. painting me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. That's so. true. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with that. And we're going to wrap up, but we would like to, to, uh, you to talk about where you're showing now. I am now exhibiting at Busboys and Poets. It's mm -hmm. incredible. I, somebody said, listen, it's like a restaurant kind of thing. But... It, I'm showing the jazz series, and I'm showing the, uh, and all the work that I used in the Spike Lee movie, um, Mo Better Blues. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. Yeah. 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 I, I got the painting with, right over Denzel's over bed. bed. Yeah, a I big saw painting. It. Yeah. And it's like it hot, huge. man. <laughs> yes, yes. And it was the, one of the first paintings that was used in the jazz series. Yeah, I zeroed in on that. It's Busboys and Poets in, in, on the 14th Street. Well, thank you so much to all of you, and especially to you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, and the other Michael, Michael. over here, thank who you. is a new member, and Lorraine, who is a new member. I'm so thank glad you. that they chose Prince George's Artists Association to come. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>